For me, I don't understand why there has been confusion, confusion as to whether or not we are under grace or under law. Remember again, brothers and sisters, the scriptural definition of sin. And that is found in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. And in the King James it reads, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth the law, also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And in the NIV, everyone who breaks, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. And in the New Living Translation, those who sin are opposed to the law of Yah, for all sin opposes the law of Yah. So sin is disobedient to Yah's laws and commands. This is a very important point that you've got to understand, brothers and sisters. Understanding the scriptural definition of sin is crucial to your understanding of a prophecy of Yeshua that we, um, I'm going to address a little later. Remember again, sin is lawlessness. Don't let these so-called preachers, and teachers, and bishops tell you otherwise. This point was so important that our brother Paul reiterated, reiterated it um, a few verses later. Um, and let's look in Romans chapter 6, verse 11 through 15. So you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to Elohim and Messiah, Yeshua, our master. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body to obey it in righteousness, to obey it in its desires. Neither present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to Elohim as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to Elohim. For sin shall not rule over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Let it not be. And again, class, what is sin? Everyone who sins breaks the law. Sin is lawlessness. And what law now do you think our brother, our, our, our dear brother John was referring to that? Of course it was the law of Yah. How can you stop sinning without honoring the law of Yah? If the law has been done away with, folks, then how can the righteousness of the law be completed in us if it no longer exists? If the law has been done away with, then how can we fulfill the law? It doesn't fit, you must admit. And that's my response now, over and over again, to those claiming that Yeshua nailed it to his cross. It just is not supported by scripture when you read scripture, the whole of scripture, and not one verse in Colossians and another verse in Ephesians. Um, you, you know, why are, why is it that people are so inclined to believe these men as opposed to Yah and his word in scripture? A man gets up on the stage in a fancy suit and tells us that Yeshua destroyed the law, yet Yeshua tells us in his very own words in Matthew chapter 5 verse 17 through 19 think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets I am not come to destroy but to fulfill for truly I say to you till heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Who are you going to believe, folks? Are you going to believe your pastor, your bishop, your teacher, or are you going to believe the words of the Messiah? Um, I'd like to read that verse again in the uh, 
New Living Translation. Uh, and it says, Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to fulfill them. I assure you, until heaven and earth disappear, even the smallest detail of Yah's law will remain until its purpose is achieved. So if you break the smallest commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys Yah's laws and teaches them will be great in the kingdom of heaven. How is that for the law has been done away with? Has heaven and earth passed away, brothers and sisters? Has all that has been prophesied about in the scriptures been fulfilled? You gotta say, at least not anybody's noticed, right? So again, who are you going to believe? The Messiah or these men? Who do you place your faith in? The words of scripture or man? Again, I say this point was so important that Yah inspired Paul to write it down, not once, in Romans 3, chapter, in Romans 3, verse 31, not twice in Romans 6, verse 11 through 15, but three times, Romans 6, verse 1 through 2. In the New King James Version, it reads, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or well, again, for clarity in the New Living Translation, Well then, should we keep on sinning so that Yah can show us more and more kindness and forgiveness? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? And Yeshua himself also expounded upon our new way of life under grace. Now regarding adultery, we previously heard or read in scripture that it says that you are committed, that you are guilty of adultery if you lie down with a married person. However, Yeshua said in Matthew 5 verse 27 through 28, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone looking at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Again in Matthew chapter 5 verse 31 through 32. And it has been said, whoever puts away his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever puts away his wife except for the matter of fornication makes her commit adultery and whoever marries a woman who has been put away commits adultery and if anything Yeshua um, made the law even more binding than before as opposed to fulfilling the letter of the law he went far into the deepest most desires and thoughts of a man's mind and heart and Matthew 5, verse 21 through, 20, 21 through 22, You heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be subject to judgment. But I say to you, that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be subject to judgment. And again in Matthew 5, verse 33 through 39, Again, you heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but you shall perform your oath. But I say to you, do not swear falsely at all, but let your yes be yes and your no be no. And what goes beyond these is from the wicked one. You heard that it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the wicked. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. And in Matthew 5, verse 43 to 48, You heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those cursing you, do good to those hating you, and pray for those insulting you and persecuting you, so that you become sons of your Father in the heavens. Therefore be perfect as your Father in the heavens is perfect. So where the law it seemed to 
address, if you will, the symptoms of sin. Yeshua came and he was addressing the root causes of sin. Thereby, in my opinion, making the law even more binding. So, his message to us was to strive for perfection. And to strive for perfection is to live a sinless life. At least to the best of your human ability. Now, the uh, so another question um, that we should ask those who say we are no longer under the law is why then are they still buying, uh, still beholding their congregations to tithe it? Why are members told that they are still required to tithe when tithing was definitely instituted under the law of Moses? Now the book of Hebrews testified that Yeshua has now replaced the priesthood and all temple related um, uh, duties or, or you know uh, regulations. So what piece of scripture is there that transfers or elevates tithing to uh, the so-called new covenant as they call it? Did, so that Yeshua abolished Sabbath observance and somehow replacing with tithing is one of the Ten Commandments? Of course not. There's not a single verse in scripture that states that the law of Yah was nailed to Yeshua's state. So, you know, how did this all come about? There were folks believing that this was in scripture well, the uh, the law was done away with. Um, let's look at Romans 8 verse 7 and I like to read this one in the uh, NIV first it says the sinful mind is hostile to Yah it does not submit to Yah's law nor can it do so and for further clarity in the New Living Translation for the sinful nature is always hostile to Yah it never did obey Yah's laws, and it never will. That is why these folks, these Gentiles, and Christian leadership will try to teach us that we do not have to obey Yah's law. It is because their nature, their mind, their sinful nature, is not subject to it. Neither does it want to be subject to it or submit to it. They want to continue doing their own thing, their own way, as they have for hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 13 through 14, and it reads, Looking for the blessed expectation and esteemed appearance of the great Elohim and our Savior, Yeshua Messiah, who gave himself for us, to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people his own possession zealous for good works now early in this study I mentioned the significance of understanding the term lawlessness the word is translated in the King James as inequity and within some translations um, it is um, well, it is the Greek word for it, for inequity, is anomia. And that is Strong's number four, 458, uh, which was also used just there in the uh, version, um, the um, scripture that I read for you from Titus. That was under uh, the word lawlessness was Strong's number 458. And it is defined as inequity, unrighteousness, transgression of the law, the condition of without law, contempt and violation of law. Now, <clears throat> this lie of lawlessness was prophesied or foretold by the Messiah in uh, Matthew 24. And then Brother Paul warned us as well that this, um, this thing was coming. And we can find that in Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 7 
and I'll read from the NIV first and then again I'll follow it up with the New Living Translation for further clarity and the NIV it reads for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way and in the NLT for this lawlessness is already at work secretly and it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way in Matthew chapter 24 verse 12 in the New King James Version and because lawlessness number 458 will abound the love of many will grow cold and again in Matthew chapter 7 verse 22 to 23 many will say to me in that day Lord Lord have we not prophesied in your name cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name and then I will declare to them I never knew you depart from me you who practice lawlessness Strong's number 458 now those were the words of the Messiah again I ask you what law do you think he was referring to he said that he will turn many away on the day of judgment who embrace this idea of his law being done away with remember brother Paul explicitly declared that we must still obey the law Romans 3 verse 31 do we then nullify the law by this faith not at all rather we uphold the law what law do you think brother Paul was referring to again in Romans 6 verse 1 through 2 what shall we say then shall we go on sinning that grace may increase by no means we die to sin how can we live in it any longer and again in Romans 6 verse 15 what then shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace by no means and how does scripture define sin first John chapter 3 verse 4 everyone who sins breaks the law in fact sin is lawlessness sin is breaking the law of Yah folks and law breaking is a practice that we are not to continue in just because we have faith in the name of the Messiah we have them we also read the Messiah himself stating that he will turn away many because they had contempt for and violated the laws of Yah well naturally one may wonder well what if I try to obey the law of Yah but I failed and I still sin it is bound to happen right despite our best efforts and we are striving to be the best I'll answer you in 1st John chapter 1 verse 8 through 9 if say if we say that we have not we have not sinned we are misleading ourselves and the truth is not in us if we confess our sins he is trustworthy and righteous to forgive us the sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness so should we sin we must confess our sins to Yeshua and he shall forgive us now after examining um, Colossians 2 14 and Ephesians 2 14 through 15 it is very clear why so many of us can be duped by their game of smoke and mirrors and for example if you quote Galatians 2 16 alone knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law but by faith in Yeshua Messiah even we believed in Matthew Yeshua that we might be justified by faith in Messiah and not by the works of the law but for by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified it would appear to support this doctrine of lawlessness however once you view Galatians 2 16 along with James 2 24 through 26 which reads you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone 
For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Scripture should become clear. We need both. Faith comes first, and through this faith will come your works. The preponderance of Scripture supports this stance, this belief that law and grace go hand in hand. We are saved by our faith in Yeshua, Messiah. However, this faith, true faith that is, will cause us to keep his laws and commandments. Therefore, to answer the question of this article, this video, it is both. We are under grace and under law. So, what Yeshua freed us from through his sacrifice was, in my opinion, was the penalty of the law. So when a brother Paul says we are no longer under the law, we are no longer under the penalty of the law. And my proof can be found in Romans 8 verse 2. For the law of the spirit of the life in Messiah Yeshua has set me free from the law of sin and of death. We are still bound to keep the laws of Yahweh. And that includes, of course, which most, well, I shouldn't say most, one of the ones that most go ahead and accept is the seven-day Sabbath. Uh, but the Christianity doesn't. Remember now, there were ten commandments, not nine. But Christianity claims that Yeshua nailed the law to his cross. What they really mean was that he nailed the Sabbath to his cross. Because if you go down the list of the ten, most of them will agree that we still should keep all of those laws. And that just because we are under, now, I say, of course, that just because we are under grace, this does not give you a license to disobey the laws of Yah. They would say, well, all of them except the fourth. And that one is, remember the Sabbath day to set it apart. So, um, if you haven't, if you're still not sure on this whole Sabbath thing, um, check out my video on Sabbath observance, please. Um, so that you will understand that we are still required to keep the seven-day Sabbath along with all of Yah's other laws. But that is a big one for the Christians because they uh, do not honor the Sabbath of Yah, the seventh day Sabbath, nor the annual Sabbath of Yah, uh, which I've just um, done a series on and will be continuing that one. Uh, I did what was called the Spring Feast, and later on I will do the Fall uh, Feast of Yah which are really just annual Sabbath days. So we've got the weekly Sabbath, and then we have the Sabbath, the annual Sabbath of Yah. All right, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 19. In closing, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. One witness does not rise up against a man concerning any crookedness or any sin that he commits. At the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses, a matter is established. And that was also, again, reaffirmed in 2 Corinthians 13 through 1 and in Matthew 18, 16. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. So it is with scriptural doctrine. You do not take one verse brothers and sisters and try to make a doctrine out of it or make a a law out of it if you will you do not attempt to well they have attempted to twist one maybe two at the most verses to fit their doctrine their paradigms now those who wish to say that the law of yah is abolished can only bring forth those two verses and even those two verses they take out of context Although these passages may initially appear to support their lawless doctrine, after careful study, it should become apparent that this, that it was other things associated 
with the law of Yah that were, for lack of a better word, a better phrase, done away with. Now the weapon of choice for the lawless group is found in Colossians uh, 2.14. And as I've already tried to uh, demonstrate through multiple translations, that Colossians 2.14 speaks of a certificate of sin being done away with, not the law of Yah. And within Ephesians 2, we discovered that hostility slash resentment between the Jews and the Gentiles, or the Israelites and the Gentiles, which was caused by the law, was taken away. Because the preponderance of scriptural evidence is in support of us keeping the law of Yah primarily as defined by the Ten Commandments. Once again, I would like to point out that for Christianity in regards to the Ten Commandments, their issue isn't truly with the, the Nine Commandments, it's primarily with the Fourth Commandment of the Ten because it has become very inconvenient here in America to honor the Sabbath day. It is only this command that they say we do not have to honor. Yet the, the disciples, our brothers of disciples, continue to observe it well after the Messiah's crucifixion and his resurrection. And I hope you don't just take my word for it, folks. Um, and um, look these things up in scripture and look at the, the and especially examine the words of the Messiah himself. I have a try I have attempted to bring forth many witnesses, scriptural witnesses to the fact that we are still required to observe the law of Yah. And for a quick recap, once again, they are Matthew there's five I'm sorry, Matthew chapter Five, verse 17 through 18, Matthew 19, 17 through 20, Romans 6, verse 15, 1 John 3, verse 4, Romans again, chapter 6, verse 1 through 2, Romans chapter 3, verse 31, and the book of James, chapter 2, verse 24. Um... So, well, after all that, folks, I hope you heard the words of Scripture. Um, I hope you're no longer willing to be led by these deceivers. Um, I've just given you seven undeniable scriptural well, verses which testify to the fact that we are still required to obey the law of Yah. The deceivers have attempted to twist only two scriptures. Two scriptures. Two, I mind you again. And these two are somehow used to refute seven direct rebuttals to this lie. How is it that they can glance over Yeshua's words when he said, do not think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to complete. Yet according to Christians, he took this law out of the way and nailed it to his stake. How could Yeshua have, free, have freed us by abolishing in his flesh the law and then say to us later on, prophesy that he's going to say to many, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. It doesn't fit, folks. You must admit. Now, all those who claim to be religious teachers and their organizations, they are practicing a game of deception, a little smoke and mirror, sleight of hand tricks with us. They're attempting to prove a particular doctrine of scripture by giving us only partial references in scripture. Then they fill the rest in with their own ideas. They give us one or two vague or improperly translated verses and then declare that they've got a doctrine while totally ignoring the other 20 or 20, 10 or 20 verses that will totally shatter their supposition. And it's been the same way, of course, with uh, the truth about law and grace here in Scripture. Now, I've included 
uh, the passages that they have used to challenge our assertion that Yah's law is still in effect. I didn't shy away from them. I went at them head on. And I've now, if I've overlooked some others, which I doubt, feel free to bring that to my attention, and um, I'll be glad to address those. Once again, they've just pulled off a very slick game of smoke and mirrors by taking these two verses and twisting them. But I think that I have given in defense of the law um, the uh, more scriptures which confirm that we are still to observe the law of Yah. The law of Yah can't be abolished according to them and still be upheld according to Yeshua and Paul. Think not that I come to destroy the law, he says. I have not come to destroy but to fulfill. And brother Paul says, do we nullify the law? No, we uphold the law. And even our brother Timothy and 2 Timothy verse uh, chapter 3 verse 16 all scripture is breathed by Yah and profitable for teaching for reproof for setting straight for instruction in righteousness that the man of Elohim might be fitted equipped for every good work now if what they assert is true then what authority do the scriptures hold at all maybe you don't believe that Yah would allow the translators to do such a thing but Yah even warned us that even the translators would um, go about trying to change his word. Um, in Jeremiah 8, chapter 8, verse 8, How do you say we are wise and the law of Yah is with us? But look, the false pen of the scribe has worked lies. He warned us beforehand that there would be some, though, in their attempts to translate his word who would translate lies. So, of course, one may wonder, well, how can we know the difference? Excellent question. It just so happens that Yah does not state any doctrine in Scripture one time. He gives us multiple levels, if you will, of confirmation, multiple witnesses, as Bible, as, as Scripture says. So, if the, if the translators have gotten a little happy, a little sloppy at one place, that's not confirmed in other places in scripture uh, we've got more than one witness to the fact of anything that Yah is trying to prove to us in scripture so I hope that again brothers and sisters you don't ignore the preponderance of scriptural evidence um, which teaches us that we are still to obey the law of Yah. And I wish to leave you with um, a few more passages from Scripture. And Hebrews chapter 10, 16, verse 16 through 17. This is the covenant that I shall make with them after those days, says Yah. I shall place my law in their to their hearts and in their minds. I shall write them and their sins and their lawlessness I shall remember no more. Matthew 13, verse 41 through 43. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. In Second Peter chapter 3, verse 17 through 18. You then, beloved ones, being forewarned, Watch, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the, with the delusion of the lawless, but rather grow in grace and knowledge of our Master and Savior, Yeshua, Messiah. To Him be both praise now and forever. Amen.